All right. So, yeah, kid, yeah I, I've never lived in Texas, but I like the way you guys introduced you know, yourself everywhere. I'm from the great state of Texas, you got to <laughs> love that love for your state. So, um, so what exactly is a bail attorney? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, you start out as a regular attorney, and then you, um, you know, when I first graduated from law school and started in private practice, I represented doctors and hospitals when they were sued. And, uh, you know, I developed a whole practice doing that. I, I've always been interested in appellate work. And there was a MedMal seminar I went to where they had a section on up and coming important cases from the Court of Appeals. And they had five of the ca- five cases and three of the five were mine. Uh, oh. And so because of my interest in appellate law, there was an, uh, a bail bondsman who got in trouble. He had 45 default judgments or default judgments when you don't file an answer when you're supposed to. Okay. And so he, so, so he asked somebody, who do you hire to, to get those set aside? They said, we need a pallet attorney. And I know a really good one and you should call him. And so that was the first work I did in the bail area. And then word of mouth pr- passed or spread. And I started representing bondsmen when they'd have issues. And then I'm Texas counsel for several insurance companies now. I'm on the board of directors of the Professional Bondsman of Texas. I go to the legislature to uh, uh, you know support bills or oppose bills to be a resource. And um, and I've written a you know a bunch of articles on bail law. And I've kind of beca- you know because of my appellate. Uh, a, a kind of uh, interest. I kind of have a, a legal. I look at the legal issues from the pellet world. I mean, from the bail world, and so I've written a lot of articles on bail reform as a result. Oh, good. Um, so yeah, like um, the, the reason uh, Ken is with us today is to talk about the FBI crime stats, and uh, we've heard a little bit about this, but we're not experts. So it's actually great to have you here to talk about this. Um, so tell us what's just going on in general with the, with the FBI stats compared to you know, what uh, is going on in the cities? Well, um, you know, this really first came up two years ago, really, uh, in the, you know, in the midterm elections, because, you know, there was this whole issue about crime was increasing and it right. was, we were starting to see problems in our urban areas. And uh, we had one side of the political spectrum say, no, crime is not increasing. Look at the FBI statistics. And and it's just a perception versus reality issue. And I I even did a debate with a representative of Civil Rights Corps, which is this law firm that's uh, activist law firm that's filing federal uh, lawsuits all over the country on bail issues and and losing them uh, but I, but they did it they were arguing the national talking points I really think they came from them oh it's just a perception issue but crime is not really increasing because of Look at the FBI statistics. So here we are, you know, we just finished a presidential election and that was the argument. But I wrote an article for the attorney at law magazine probably a month ago now. And in the, the point of it was there's reason to, to call into question the FBI statistics. And, and the reasons are the FBI just changed over to a new system of reporting and gathering this data four or five years ago. And it requires an investment of, of infrastructure, of equipment for all the local police forces. And so some of, the, and they've been slow in changing over and several of the largest police forces in the country, the LA and New York, we're not even tied into the system. So, you know, uh, scientists were saying, look, it's incomplete data. And, um, and you know, there are other uh, federal agencies that track crime, like CDC tracks homicides, and their data was showing a 20% increase instead of what the uh, – contrary to what the FBI statistics were showing. And then Trump was show, was was uh, pointing out the uh, DOJ surveys on crime that they've been doing for decades, and that survey was showing a substantial increase of crime pretty much across the spectrum. And we don't even have to get into all the statistics on carjacking and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but um, so I wrote that article, and I was just saying, you know, there's reason to call into question. Well, nine days after my article was published, the FBI – change their statistics yeah. so suddenly <laughs> after all these years uh instead of showing crime going down it was showing crime going up and it's still incomplete and so suddenly uh the you know the democrats lost all of their 
their one argument, their one argument on why crime was not increasing was the DOJ, I mean, the FBI statistics. And so immediately they did a 180 degree turn. And, and that's why they spent the next week or two saying Trump is a fascist, Trump is Hitler, because they had no, they had no argument on crime anymore. <clears throat> So um, my my experience is I lived in Chicago most of my life and I lived in like uh, Denver, Seattle, and now Vegas. And when they keep saying the crime is going down, I'm like, I mean, I knew it was just common sense wise that that's not even possible because I, I pay attention to stuff. I crime is a, is a thing for me. Um, and being going back to Chicago, they were caught had to be like 15, 20 years ago trying to reduce the murder rate. By saying accidental shootings or suicide or gun misfire. And the only reason they got caught was because one of the news channels actually spent 24 hours a day listening to the police scanner <laughs> and, and, and kept really detailed notes. So the question I have for you is when a government entity uh, mis mislabels crime, should there be charges brought against them for that? Well, should there be consequences? Absolutely. You know, we have a we have a much more current example of that out of Houston, Texas, and Harris County, like the third largest county in the country. I mean, they had a big press conference saying crime is going down, crime is going down, and you know, there's a political incentive when you're in the incumbent the incumbent to say crime is going down. But then they got a new mayor, <laughs> and a month later, suddenly they had a press conference to announce that the city police department had improperly closed over 260,000 oh. criminal cases Jeez. with the notation lack of personnel. <laughs> and the mayor, the new mayor called that out. Uh, well, I th it was after he was elected. So, yeah, I think it was a consequence of him. And the police chief had to resign ultimately. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's easy to manipulate the numbers to show crime is going down when you close 260,000 cases. And, you know, that has an impact on the FBI statistics, too, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it does. So then Houston, they have a pretty good mayor then, as it sounds like. Is that? Well, he's new. And I would say he's finding his footing. He's a, uh, but he's an experienced politician and he's kind of, uh, navigating the middle between the the two parties, he is a Democrat, but he's law and order Democrat. Oh, good. Uh, but he's also take no prisoners kind of. He used to be in the uh, state Senate, and I've testified before his committee before. And if you know, I've been there to testify against his bill. And if you're there to testify against one of his bills, you're going to get yelled at. And so I got oh. pretty used to being yelled at when he was proposing bills. Good for you. Um, so I, I know that uh, crime uh, was was really going down in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, and I was wondering if you had ever done any comparison to the modern spike with uh, you know the 1980s and 1970s. Uh, you know, is it is it as bad as it was back then, or are we still down from there, or uh, you know how does it look compared to then? Well, we've had us okay. So I would like to compare what we're going through now is as we're repeating that cycle that you're yeah. referring to from the '60s. You know, in the '60s we felt more safe, so we became more forgiving in our criminal laws, and then as a result of that, crime started to go up, and then the two political parties couldn't agree on how to address it. What really happened is one party refused to participate in fixing the system, and so we had a backlash, and as a result, we had Reagan and we had the war on drugs. And so right now we've been having that same cycle happen again we were you know in the in the late uh you know 2019 i guess uh 18 17 we were more forgiving on our criminal laws because we felt safe and we've had a, a huge swing to the left uh look at what happened in california and you know where they decriminalized uh theft under 950 dollars and they they did it in a very uh, crazy way they did it with with lying to the voters in my opinion and as cool. a result of that the current DA was defeated by 22 points in <laughs> LA County and that proposition that the de decriminalize or the effect of it was to decriminalize theft was uh, rolled back substantially uh, with a new proposition uh, in in on in uh, the election this month by 20 something points. So I, I think we are having that backlash uh, pretty heavy right now where we're swinging back to the right. But the problem is, and you know, this is where the left just uh, 
you know, they just missed the mark. They could have prevented the, the pendulum from swinging too far to the right by moderating their position, by recognizing that things were not working, but they refused. And so the, the, the pendulum is going to swing pretty hard to the right. And it, it won't stay there very long because when right. it went to the left, it was unacceptable to the public because there, when it went too far, because the public demands public safety. But it, when, when it goes too far to the right, you know, what the demand is going to be, let's hold everybody in jail until their case is decided and then go send them to prison. Well, the public's not going to be willing to pay for that. Right. Right. So actually, I sort of touched back on that when uh, the California law saying this shoplifting, or I think you said 950 is not, they won't even show up. Chicago did that in around 2005 <laughs> and they put the market $600. Um, wow. so all the 24 hour stores uh, or the late night open stores just hire big employees. <laughs> and for, so for some odd reason, we've had a bunch of beat up people in alleys. <laughs> <laughs> drag them out back and beat the hell out of them. <laughs> well, and the way Cal the way California did it is they the referendum changed certain felonies to misdemeanors, and the argument was, well, they'll still you know they'll still have to answer for their crime, but then but they'll be able to find jobs because they're not convicted of a felony. But then right. when they changed it to a misdemeanor, the DAs in our uh, urban areas said, well, we're no longer going to prosecute it's it. Dropping, so, yeah. so that's how they lied about it and then decriminalized de decriminalized it. Yeah. So I've got a question on uh, no cash bail. What, yes, sir. What effect does no cash bail have on the crime rate? Well, you know, you know, when you th that's a great question because you think about it and say, well, how does the release mechanism that we use affect crime? And it does it very much so. Uh, and and let me just say that we have different types of release. We can release you on a, a, a private surety bond. We call it different things, different places. But let's just say on a bond provided by the private industry, right. or we have something called simple release, where uh, where you're just going to be released on your promise to come back. In California, it would be called release on no bail, I mean, released on zero bail. In New York, it'd be called release on zero, a uh, no bond. And in Texas, it'd be called release on a personal bond. And then, you know, cash bonds, like you, you, you've you mentioned Chicago and Illinois, we've had all this uh, debate about cash. We've got rid of cash bonds in the state of Illinois. Well, that's a cash bond. That's not a private surety bond where you, you put up either either 10% of the amount of the bond to the court or the full amount of the bond in cash to the court. Um, and so, uh, but but we have the private surety system, we have some type of simple release, and those have completely different failure to appear rate. So the private industry it has less than a 10% failure to appear rate, hmm. like, uh, and simple release uh, has at least a 50 or 80% failure to appear rate. Like, uh, I did a podcast with the DA in, in California. They use simple release for all misdemeanors in California. He said they have an 80% failure to appear rate. Houston, Texas currently uses simple release for misdemeanors, and they have an 80% failure to appear rate over that. For, according to HarrisCountyCourtWatch.com, I'm looking at two years' worth of data. And when, so when you miss court, your case, you know, Criminal cases are unique. They have to be put on hold until you come back. And like in California on misdemeanor cases, there's a there's a time limit. You know, the clock, the clock is ticking. So uh -huh. if your case isn't resolved within a certain amount of time under the Speedy Trial Act, it's dismissed. So it's it's a catch-22. You don't show up. They can't make you come back unless you come back on your own because it's a misdemeanor. And so if you stay gone, they dismiss your case. Well, so the problem is – no cash bail creates chaos because yeah. the failure to appear rate is so high. Uh, chaos creates pressure to dismiss cases. Dismissing cases is perceived by criminals as a green light to commit more crime. And so you think, oh, well, the way we release somebody, they didn't have an impact on crime. It has a huge impact on crime. You see, it's funny you mentioned that because when I, was, I started doing some research on this, and almost every article said it has no impact on crime. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. So, well, yeah, yeah. And there's a reason why yeah. there's all these think tanks that are coming out with studies and they really cook the books. Yeah. And, and it's really the effect of George, so George Soros. And there's yes, books yes, and is. many articles that are written about this. But George Soros has a plethora of organizations that he supports so and but you can break them into four categories there's the group that will give you money to get you elected and then there's the second group after you're elected you they get 
they invite you to seminars and they give you, here's the quid pro quo, here's what you're going to no oh. longer do as a DA that was supported by us, and they're terrible things. You're not going to ever, not going to seek enhancements anymore. So a drug dealer found with 30 pounds of meth is going to get a two week sentence because he's just going to be charged with possession <laughs> instead of all the enhancements and get 30 years. And then there's the third group, which is the groups you're talking about that are all these think tanks that are releasing cook the book studies that say yeah. oh you're safer for release for releasing more people from prison yeah. and then the fourth group they have is pr firms that will give you press releases that you will issue saying i'm starting these new policies and these studies show that they will not increase crime and it's all just crap yeah because <laughs> the reason i was bringing that up is when uh, when I saw that the article, all, these, all the articles saying the crime doesn't go up, I knew of a story out of Denver or out of the Denver area where a, a man stole a car, got arrested, got out no cash bond, and that afternoon got arrested again for stealing another car. <laughs> so yeah. I want to find that story. So I kind of went to Google real quick, put man arrested, blah blah blah, and uh, I I couldn't surf through all the stories. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. There is a lot of people committing crimes who got out with no cash bail within the next 24 hours. <laughs> so, well, you know, we were we were keeping track. We were looking for records of, of people during COVID. And I think the record was like five, six, seven, eight times someone wow. being arrested within 24 hours because oh. they were just being released, just being released. Well, I, I would try and just break the record. Like, I mean, well, how high can I go? <laughs> Well, yeah, and some of them were committing crimes, trying to break into cars, stealing cars from the parking lot of the jail as they were leaving. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, actually, wasn't there a, a Congress member who got carjacked in D.C.? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a Supreme Court justice. Oh, oh yeah, oh. one of them got... Do you um, have another question? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I was wondering, uh, so the discrepancies uh, in the FBI stats, do they only track... Uh, like violent crimes, or is it violent with theft, or is it like all crimes, like you know, like embezzlement and, and other things that you know maybe we don't want that kind of stuff, but it's not a danger to society. Um, as well, as let me make know. let me make two points on that. Number one, I, there's a whole class of things that they track, and you know you have to have certain equipment, and it's automatically reported. So you know if you look want to look at the statistics, you could. You know, we don't know whether it was nefarious that they were thinking Trump was going to win and two weeks before the election they decided to change the stats or whether another police unit or police uh, group uh, got the equipment and got into the system and then they just updated all their data and that's what caused the change in data. Now, the other thing that I want to comment to you about is this, oh, well, there's some crimes that are not really, you know, we shouldn't be too concerned about, and, and, you know, this theft under $950 started out as that. And and let's look at the impact that's had on California. I mean, stores are closing left and right because they can't withstand $25,000 a day in shoplifting. Right. And, you know, it, drugs use in, around those areas have just become rampant because in conjunction with that, we're no longer prosecuting something, some drug crimes. So what's the impact of that on commercial buildings? In San Francisco, we've got buildings that have sold for 30 to 50% of their value just four years ago. We In Minneapolis, that has the same problem. We've got two buildings that sold for 9% of their value from the last time they sold. And wow. we've got the uh, commercial property default rate has gone from 5% to 40%. And so if we say, well, are there some crimes that don't really hurt anybody? Those very crimes are fixing to impact cities' taxes tremendously on what they're collecting. Because at the very least, the property value is going to go down for their commercial properties. But really, the problem is they're closing and they're moving out because the counties won't keep the, their businesses safe for people to, to patronage. Well, well, I mean, we're a couple of libertarians here, so like when you say tax revenues might go down, I, I, we're like, oh, let's do more of this kind of crime. Um, but, <laughs> so even even you have to admit, for example, you know, having a squirrel, a pet squirrel in your house, and then having the cops come and, and raid your house and kill your squirrel and the raccoon. I, I mean, yeah, and a raccoon as well. Sorry, um, I, I, that's kind of ridiculous, right? Like the squirrel's not hurting anybody; uh, they're not driving down property values for anyone. So, I, uh, but I, I was just wondering. Uh, instead of um, going hard on that point, you know, do these stats that were uh, these FBI stats, do they take account of that or 
is it only certain types of crimes? That that was kind of more of the question I was asking. You know, I don't. I know you were asking, and I, and I was trying to, in a finesse way, in a really smart <laughs> sounding way, to say I don't know the answer to. Okay, that's <laughs> Tricks me. I but, didn't answer the question. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I didn't know if you would know that answer or not because uh, it's just something. But that I, I will say, know. what was the name of the squirrel? Was it? Peanuts. Peanut and, and uh, Fred. Fred, was the, Fred one, was of, one of my favorite memes that came out the week after the election was uh, it was it took Lord of the Rings and you know when yeah. uh, Gandalf oh, was Gandalf the White they took that and it showed a white squirrel and it says I am now Peanut the White <laughs> and I'm here at your crucial moment and I will be with you and it, it was hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> yes. I'm always I always make sure people bring up the raccoon because as a child I had a pet mm-hmm. raccoon. So I'm kind of partial to the rest. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, I really haven't I haven't followed that story other than the from the standpoint of how crazy it was, and you know, there, it impacted probably a small percentage of the voters from that area because it was it was insulting. I mean, we can't yeah. we can't fight crime, we can't hold people in jail, yeah. but we're gonna we're gonna euthanize Peanut and the raccoon. Right. Yeah. Hey, thank you. It's, no, <laughs> it's just another example of government overreach. Um, but so here's my question with the with the election, and and as Trump's kind of bringing up the cabinet and understanding there's a difference between local and federal law. Do you think Trump's going to have a big impact on the crime rate across America? Well, yes. You know, one of the biggest things I think that the um, office of the president does is bring a bully pulpit to issues. Yep. And so, uh, I mean, you can see the freak out right now by just his nominations. And, and you know, he's nominated <laughs> his attorney general, and there was a tremendous freak out over who it was. Yeah, a little bit. And, uh, and, there, and the rumor is that that's – not even going to be the biggest freak out because he's going to nominate his FBI director probably next, mm-hmm. and that that one is supposed to be even yeah. a bigger uh, well, a bomb. Cash, Cash Patel, I think, is, is I a, he still owes the Libertarians our our person? Yeah, he, so, he has not uh, confirmed that yet. So Trump did promise on because we invited him to the Libertarian convention, and he promised to put one Libertarian on his cabinet. So we're waiting for that. <laughs> Well, there's the, the speculation. Uh, well, there was some speculation about who that would be, and uh, and 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 the reaction to just the speculation was glorious to watch. But um, but I, you know, I think that he will bring a spotlight to the crime issue. I mean, and it, even if he doesn't, let me tell you, I've been telling people. You know that I know we're we're stuck in this identity politics, and and the Democrats are voting. I mean, they're hoping that the abortion issue would save them, and it is <laughs> not. Do. But I was telling people for one election, for just one election, vote on crime. Yeah. If you vote on crime this election, then suddenly the Democrats will go back to be a law and order party. And so, even without, even if Trump doesn't, you're going to see this metamorphosis, this this battle, this uh, civil war in the Democrat Party. Because uh, crime is is an issue. Well, AOC removed all her pronouns off her ex account today, so I think we're moving in the right direction with that. Uh, yeah, so we're actually both. Uh, and um, I remember Mayor Daly, and it, <laughs> he was no nonsense, uh, tough on crime Democrat. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, like Trump had a stuff done. Trump had a huge commercial that was that he played in Texas. I'm sure he played everywhere, but you know they're fighting for they them. <laughs> Trump is fighting for you, and it was such a brilliant commercial. He had some great commercials. So um, I've kind of gone through all my questions. I think Dave, you're. I, I do have one more. It's kind of a nerdy stats question, and and you might not have the answer to this either. But uh, it was just something that was interesting to me. So um, I, w- I was wondering if there's any qualitative difference um, about the victims of of crime uh, more recently. So, for example. We know that um, most murders are committed uh, by someone the victim knows. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that starting to change? Like, is it more random, uh, or or is it no, just okay. more of the same? No, let me make two points about that. On uh, on on murders, we know that fifty percent of all murder victims in the United States currently are young black males, yeah. and by and large, the murderer of those young black males yeah. are young black males as right. well. And, you know, the, one of the things that just drives me crazy is we, in this bail reform debate, we have flipped it and so, somehow we're favoring the murderer over the victim in, in the name of social justice. And uh, they're both, I mean, they, everybody bleeds red, but when the murderer is murdering someone of the same race and we decide that we need to 
favor the murderer over the victim. We It's day's night and black is white and it's crazy. But where this bail reform movement has done the most damage is in the area of domestic violence. Because, you know, let's say that you are being uh, abused by your significant other. And, you and you know, I think one of the shocking things about that is probably 50% of domestic violence uh, victims are male. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a statistics that is mostly women. But if you decide that you want to do something about this, you want to get out of this situation, you know, bail reform has created a situation where you can't go to the police. Right. You have to, one, f- plan your escape. Two, plan your uh, – how you're going to live after you've escaped. And three, who, what's going to be your uh, 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 setup for giving you support? And after all that, after you – I mean, it's an almost an afterthought now that you will think about going to the police. Uh, because, uh, I mean, we have too many examples. And the worst example that that I can think of is um, Caitlin Guajardo out of Harris County, Houston, Texas, where her husband was uh, arrested uh, for leaving the scene of an accident and got a personal bond. So he got simple release. And then he got arrested for domestic violence while he was on that personal bond. <laughs> so he's violating the conditions of his bond by getting a new charge. What did they do? They turned around and gave him another personal bond, and he got out. And within ver- very short period of time, he went home, and he killed his wife, and he stabbed yeah. her 30-something times in her stomach because she was pregnant, and he oh. didn't want another man raising his child. Wow. Wow. So we're at the point next that we've gone through all our questions. And I, in, in prepping for this show, I did a lot. Of, I was doing, trying to do some research. And I noticed you're kind of on the podcast circuit right now, uh, which I think is awesome. Um, so we're, being that we're libertarians, um, I kind of, I kind of know your view on, uh, like the bail and something like that by watching your other interviews. Um, I'm more of a moderate libertarian and he's more of an anarchist libertarian. Uh, the reason I bring this up is if you have any questions, you're if you're like data collecting anything and you want some um, difference of opinion, if you want to ask us questions and you'll see we have we'll have very well. Very I would love to talk to you about. Let's talk about Oregon. So we've got Portland, we've got Oregon where they've decriminalized almost all heavy drugs, and we've yep. seen the terrible impact that's had. You know, yes. crime, uh, uh, drug use went from six percent to twelve percent. And, and but they were setting a record every month for uh, overdoses, and they finally allowed those statutes to expire, and so they so they went back to their old statutes. So what was y'all? I mean, what I know y'all a libertarian position is we don't we want to decriminalize heavy drugs, but did the Portland experience, the Oregon experience, impact y'all's uh, thoughts on that issue? Well, Portland is actually one of my favorite cities to visit. Um, at least it was prior to 2020. I've been there a couple of times since COVID. Um, but yeah, but Seattle and Portland are kind of mirror images of each other. And it's, it's disgusting what's happening in these cities. Uh, and, and, and the one thing people don't realize in these homeless camps are the, is the sex trade. Young women are being, oh, really? they're being chained into tents and they're being sold for, for drugs. There was uh, one story out of uh, Ballard in Seattle that a girl OD'd three times, and this final time she passed away. And the reporter said, "Oh, you may know her because she would free, she would uh, be with this gentleman, and he would trade her for sex and drugs." And she died at eighteen, and she was with him for three years. Wow! And that was in the paper. And I'm like, nobody is comment. Nobody's freaking out about this. We have a confirmed fifteen year old being traded for sex and drugs. In the homeless community, uh, when they closed the jungle, the jungle was a homeless camp under I ninety and I five. They found literally found women chained women in, uh, yeah women chained into tents. Some were underage, and they were they were spiked wow. down and chained to it. So yeah, the the homeless crisis in this country is way out of control. Um, so yeah, no, I and I, they destroyed two very very good cities that had very low crime rates before all this kicked off. So uh, well, well so, and see, oh, go ahead. Well, see, my position on that is, you know, you need the uh, the hammer of the criminal justice system on drugs. So the threat of sending someone to prison if they will not go to drug rehab. So we need the, the hammer, the threat of prison 
to encourage people to go to rehab because rehab has a 75% failure rate when you go there for the first time. So we need to be able to send them back and back and back. And if you don't have the hammer, I think the lesson of Portland is they won't go. I mean, they set up all these, uh, all these uh, programs for them to get treatment and they took advantage of it is 0.01% of the time. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 I saw it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to answer your question from my perspective. Um, so when, when I when I saw these uh, decriminalization laws come out in Oregon, uh, I was critical of them right away because what they always do, uh, and this is both the left and the right, they always do this halfway thing where mm-hmm. they say, "Oh, we're gonna uh, let you use personal amounts, but it's still illegal to sell." Um, so essentially what that does, is it, it still keeps the black market there. Yeah. Um, yes. black market, uh, they're going to have you know, low quality drugs that are laced with all sorts of things. Um, you know, you, you, you have no restitution if, if someone kills you, if you OD, right. I mean, we don't, we don't see uh, Budweiser poisoning people, for example, uh, your Starbucks is not poisoning people, right? You can just go to Starbucks and drink your coffee in a safe environment and there's no stigmatism there. Uh, and, and the other reality is whatever you do, people are going to do these drugs. Um, you, you're not going to stop them. People do drugs in prison, right? We can't keep the drugs out of prison. So we, we need a whole radically new approach where, you know, it, if you do a crime on drugs, yes, straight to jail, right? No tolerance for that kind of shit. But but just doing drugs in your own house, oh, yeah. you know, like, I, I really, I don't care. I, I, like, I don't... If you, I care. I care deeply. Uh, I mean, I had a sister who had a car accident when in 1989, the year I graduated from law school, and she broke every bone in her face. Yeah. And she started a 30-year drug addiction to prescription painkillers. Right, so well, it wasn't even illegal drug drugs. Do this to you. But, uh, but, I mean, I tried everything. I tried yeah. to get her put in jail because the jail, I was a young right. attorney, the jail was a poor man's drug rehab. Yeah. And, and we've, we've completely removed right. that as a possibility as the, tr- uh, the poor people's drug rehab. And I mean, my sister was strung out on prescription drugs for the next 30 years. And wow. it wasn't until her husband died when I stepped in and had her declared incompetent that we got her into an assisted living facility and they monitored her, her drugs. She, she couldn't give them to herself. And her last four years was probably the best of her life mm-hmm. uh, of, for that whole time. Yeah. And so I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, we if we give like up, that. if we give up on drugs, you know, we're giving up on crime. Um, there's a book I read that said, you know, 80% of all crime can be traced some way or another to, to drugs. And then I would make one more comment to your thing about, you know, they didn't, uh, decriminalize it, uh, uh, the whole way. And so they didn't go far enough. I mean, look at California on uh, marijuana use. I mean, the, I, I read an article and I even posted it. And then I realized that Facebook was, uh, was not allowing that to happen right before the election. Shocker. But I did a pod. I did a podcast with the author. The legal drug drug trade. We, uh, we lost. Yeah. Are you there in, in California for marijuana? Hear me? Oh yeah. yeah. And it's been um, it's been taken over by the cartels, and I mean not just shipping marijuana in; they're moving their whole operations into California, and they're bringing in workers too because they're not scared. They've we've decriminalized marijuana, so what are you going to do when you find them on federal lands uh, misappropriating the use of it to growing marijuana, and they brought in illegal immigrants to be their people? I mean, Mexico's not the only country doing that. We've got Russia's uh, Russian gangs or cartels, and and China Chinese cartels doing the same thing all over uh, the country, and you don't hear about it because yep. Facebook and other social medias are are editing it out before. The, Election. You only the first time I heard it, other than that article I read, was Donald Trump saying it. Yeah. And and then you came up with the the apartment complexes being uh, right. uh, overrun by cartels, and suddenly uh, you've got the mainstream media having a, a complete meltdown and going, "Oh, it's only a a few. It's only a small number." <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, you have J.D. Vance saying, "Are we in the United that. States or what?" Because I only one. Kids. Yeah. I mean. So but, I I have a problem with that. I mean, I, I think drugs are drugs, and right. when you start having um, 
we're going to we're going to do it legally we're going to raise taxes on it we're going to make a whole bunch of money that doesn't ever happen it doesn't yeah, ever happen. I don't want any the taxes money on never it. goes where it's supposed to go i don't go. want any taxes on it but actually southern colorado has the same problem with the cartels moving in and growing yeah. there cuz they were the first state to legalize officially legalize marijuana and the cartels and they didn't have a i believe when they first passed it they didn't have a cap on how much how many plants you could grow and the cartels were coming in and growing hundreds of plants legally so yeah, yeah. They, they've now reduced that number down to kind of stop that. Um, but yeah, I think. Are we, yeah, um, yeah. Do you have any uh, like contact info for our viewers? Uh, you know, they can find you uh, like a website or Twitter uh, or whatever. Sure. So if you want more information on the uh, you know criminal justice issues, you can go to our website, the uh, pbtx.com, which is the professional bondsman of Texas. So pbtx.com. We have a blog where we hi highlight uh, important criminal justice issues. And we also have our own podcast called The Bell Post. There's a link to it on our menu. But you can also just go straight to thebellpost.com. And if you if talk about is criminal justice issues, you want to know what the New Jersey plan is, we've got an episode on it. You want to know what about uh, charitable bell funds and why they're being restricted in states, we've got multiple episodes on it. Awesome. Yeah, we had come to interview and this pretty close because we – we don't really do interviews like this, so we just signed up for a basic Zoom account, and they're giving me a minute, 52 seconds to really <laughs> shut us off. <laughs> well, thank you for I joining understand. us. Yeah, but yeah, I, I did definitely yeah, want to thank sure. you uh, for, for talking to us, and if you ever want to come back on again, please reach out to us. We'll, we'll upgrade Zoom so we can talk longer if you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are other people I've talked to, and we take whatever. I think you have to take an eight-minute break, and then we come back on. So, yeah, oh, that's great. <laughs> So yeah, no, um, this is great. I, I really love talking with it. I'm talking about this because crime is an, is an issue for me too. I agree. It's 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 yeah. fixed. Well, and you know, how can we fix an issue if neither if one side of the electorate won't even admit it's a problem? So, yeah. No, thank you very much for yeah. having me, guys. Yep. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a great have a great day. Right, bye bye. Okay, bye bye.